and I've watched some of my best monsters wiped out in ridiculous ways, I can totally appreciate these creative kills and campaign decisions that are sprinkled all throughout Goblin Slayer. It makes me feel like I'm actually watching a D&D campaign unfold before my eyes and not just simply another fantasy story. And that's just, to me, is so cool. One of the hardest things to do as a writer... Uh, trying to capture a D&D story is to reproduce that inventiveness and spontaneity that role players have. You have to really think how people would think outside of the box and how they might even overthink a basic decision or just charge headlong into a situation. It takes work and time to get this inventiveness right and to make it feel genuine on the page. I worked once on a novella, which you can go check out in the link in the description box below, which is my attempt to translate the experience of gaming and the silliness of gaming with friends and the disjointed way that a Dungeon Master story gets told to the players and all of that into a cohesive story. I thought I was doing a pretty good job as a novice writer. I mean, it's not the best story I've ever written, but I thought I was doing pretty good. And then I watched Goblin Slayer and I was like, oh boy! This this is what I wanted to create. Just, well, minus the whole edgy opening bit. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of that. I mean, I've already praised the first and seventh episodes earlier in this video, but I will admit I probably could have done without some of the scenes in the, uh, in the first episode. In any case, one last thing on the subject of Goblin Slayer in D&D &D is this. I can't be the only one who wants to see a face-off between Goblin Slayer and not the Brave, right? Right? Okay, for those of you who are uninitiated, Not is a character from Critical Role Season 2, and she happens to be a goblin. Goblin Slayer once said you could look really, really hard and maybe find one good goblin out there in the world, and this precious cinnamon roll of a thief is just that. Oh, right, well, okay, to be more technical, uh, she's at least the best goblin we could hope to meet so far in any kind of story. And though I said thief, she is more accurately put a rogue and arcane trickster. And she roams about with her closest friend, Caleb, a human wizard, with poor people skills and even poor hygiene. And they are both members of the motley group, the Mighty Nine! I had to do some research to try and set up a potential battle between Goblin Slayer and not just, well, because, as I said, I really want this face off. Well, you see, Goblin Slayer himself has no set quote-unquote level, per se, but we do know that he is a silver-ranked adventurer. The ranks in the series are numbered in 10, with silver being the third highest rank. With the normal D&D level cap being 20, that would put Goblin Slayer, logically, at level 15 or 16. However, the magical ogre that he fights in episode 4 gave him quite the challenge, and that brute was definitely nowhere near the highest level in the game. We know from episode 5 that silver-ranked adventurers also gain their stats from being reliable and capable, not necessarily from being overpowered. Given Goblin Slayer's strength, then, and his ingenuity and his capabilities, I would more readily place him at level 10, though he could be a level or two higher depending on how you want to argue things. I mean, he has already by now taken down a Beholder and some high-level bosses, so, I mean, placing him at level 12 is also within the realm of reason, but to be safe, I'm going to place him at level 10. Not, on the other hand, is level 7, with decent armor and health, and she is wickedly intelligent. Just like Goblin Slayer, she is super resourceful, and perhaps even more so. She has a very good habit of hiding herself and has made many of her best kills doing sneak attacks. She also has access to magic that Goblin Slayer certainly does not have, and she uses heavy crossbows and gunpowder to devastating effect. I will gladly concede, though, that in a head-to-head -head fight, unless Goblin Slayer fails every single saving throw after succumbing to hideous laughter, which I would love to see this stoic guy laugh, not probably wouldn't make it out on her own. I easily hand the matchup to Goblin Slayer. But there's one thing, though. Just as Goblin Slayer is dutifully accompanied by Priestess wherever he goes, wherever Nod is, Caleb is not far behind. 
and Priestess herself does not have enough magic in her arsenal to stop Caleb the wizard. That's just the way of it. And if things got real, it would be Goblin Slayer's party versus the Mighty Nine. Five against seven. Yes, there are only seven members of the Mighty Nine. It's a Zemian thing. It would be a much closer battle in this case, and Goblin Slayer would be confused by the much larger Goblin Ford, who is in fact a Warlock Orc. And chances are that Goblin Slayer would get the living snot Eldritch blasted out of him by Ford. Spell reserves and equipment taken into account along with their long battle histories, I would probably give this fight over to the Mighty Nine. They have a much larger party, they've already taken down way bigger and scarier things than goblins such as spirits, a hydra, a manticore, and loads of undead. Not to mention a raiding party of goblins and trolls. But who knows? That is, the, that is the fun and adventure of playing D&D. You never know whom the dice will favor. It would be nevertheless a magnificent battle. If you all want to see a possible D&D battle played out here on the channel between Goblin Slayer's Band and the Mighty Nine, then say so down in the comment section. I guarantee it would be fantastic to do. So to reiterate, the three lessons to take away from Goblin Slayer are these. Number one, keep your story's tone and themes consistent with its opening. Don't give in to presenting your audience with some simple edgy clickbait just because that will draw attention. No, you never want to fool your audience into reading something that they didn't sign up for. They will not take kindly to that. Secondly, know how to use names in your story. The presentation and use of names, or the lack thereof, has major effects on how readers perceive and relate to your cast. Lastly, pay attention to how Goblin Slayer gives autonomy to its characters. This is key to creating an engaging cast and also capturing the spirit of a D&D game, if you're trying to translate your tabletop antics to the written page. But in overall, having characters who are able to make creative and individual decisions, and not just because the plot mandates uh, such actions, really makes for very cool, engaging, and creative individuals. And these are the kind of people that your re that readers gravitate to, that they want to get more of because they're so individualistic. Well, that does it for this video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen, please like and subscribe. And also check out our podcast first season, if you haven't already, on Podbean, iTunes, and Google Play. We also have some neat stuff for you to check out on Tumblr, Reddit, and Pinterest. And don't forget, if you want me to do a battle simulation between Goblin Slayer's party and the Mighty Nine, then please leave a comment down below. Links for all of our sites are in the description box. And finally, we would love your recommendations for terrible fanfics to do epic readings of. Please send us your recommendations via our Twitter at Camille's Harem. We would absolutely love to go over them. We love causing intense pain to ourselves by reading terrible stories, and it makes for a great laugh. And yeah, that's all of it. So until the next video, tschüss.